Hi, this is a video lecture on the newborn specifically targeting thermal regulation. I'll be going along with your PowerPoint slides uh, so you can just follow along if you like. All right. Um, there's four goals when we're discussing the newborn. The first two uh, have to do a lot to do with um, thermal regulation, and one is maintaining body heat and also monitoring respiratory function. The other is minimizing the risk of infection and providing infant nutrition and care are also very important goals. But mainly for this particular uh, video, we're going to be talking about the first two goals, again, maintaining body heat and monitoring respiratory function. So before the goals, we're going to talk about a little bit about fetal circulation because oxygen in utero is completely different than once the infant is born. And there's three main structures, and I know you've probably heard a little bit about this in pediatrics, but we're going to be talking about the ductus spinosus, the ductus arteriosus, and the foramen ovale. Okay, so they play very important but very different roles when it comes to fetal circulation. For starters, in fetal circulation, the lungs are not filled with air. They're actually filled with fluid, as are the alveoli. And the alveoli are those potential air sacs, and they play a vital role when a baby is transitioning from fetal circulation to our circulation. Okay? Oxy oxygen is transferred across the placenta via the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord has three vessels, two arteries and one vein. What's different is that their arteries, the two arteries can contain deoxygenated blood as it leaves the, the fetal unit, and the, ve the vein carries the oxygenated blood to the fetus, okay? Blood flow is diminished through the pulmonary circuit, or the other word for that is the lungs, compared to after birth as the pulmonary arteries are constricted before birth. So now blood flow is diverted across the ductus arteriosus. So wait, let me start again. Okay, so when blood enters the system, it enters, um, it, it actually merges with the ductus spinosus and allows the majority of the blood flow to get to the heart faster. The remainder of the blood is used as perfusion mostly to the liver and the periphery. On the way up to the heart, the inferior vena cava joins in with blood from the lower part of the body, and together they head towards the form, foramen ovale, which allows for more than half of that blood that's going through that um, vena cava to enter the, our, uh, the right atrium immediately to cross over to the left atrium without going through the lungs. The ductus arteriosus connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta, and its function is for really perfusion only. So when the cord clamps and that baby takes its first breath, everything changes. And basically, when that baby does take that first breath, fetal circulation ceases. And with that first breath, air pushes into the lung due to the chemical factors, which we're going to talk about. Like, why is a baby going to breathe? And chemical factors is one of them. Um, with air in the lungs, this increases pulmonary blood flow, which causes increased left atrial pressure, which functionally closes the foramen ovale. And for the first time, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood is separated. After birth, the ductus arteriosus becomes functionally closed within a few hours after birth, and the increased oxygen is the reason for this. The ductus spinosus closes within a few days and then becomes a ligament. So the synopsis really is, is that as the lungs expand, when the air enters into the system, the pulmonary arteries dilate, allowing that, that oxygenated blood flow to, to go. Fluid actually leaves the alveoli gradually. Um, pulmonary blood flow increases because the arteries are open. So as I said, they dilate to allow the blood flow and the blood oxygen levels to increase. Now, surfactant. Surfactant is a lipoprotein, um, and it's detectable around 24 weeks, and this lines the alveoli so they remain open. Without it, the alveoli would collapse with that first breath, causing severe respiratory distress. So that is one of the reasons we'll, get, we're, we'll talk about it later in the semester, is why we give steroids to moms who are having preterm labor in the event that they deliver prematurely to help increase that surfactant production and assist with lung maturity. So again, remember that there's all these chemical factors that are going to occur. So cardiovascular respiratory is really two of the, the, the system's main changes, okay? So why does a baby breathe? So there's four factors. One is chemical, mechanical, sensory, and thermal. So when we talk about chemical factors, we just kind of talked about that. Chemoreceptors respond to changes in the environment. At birth, when fetal circulation is ending, there's the shift in oxygen levels, pH levels, and CO2 levels. And this triggers the chemoreceptors to say, breathe, baby, breathe. Mechanical factors have to do with that mechanical, um, where the fetal chest is compressed and then it recoils. Um, air, air enters and causes that, that 
for that baby to take that breath. Thermal factors is where you're going from this warm environment to this cool environment and you tend to kind of like uh, the, that stimulus to breathe is there. And then sensory is that tactile stimulation. We dry, we stimulate, we're rubbing, we're flicking their heels, um, there's lights, people are screaming, people are crying, and it's like, what is going on here? So those are some of those reasons there. Um, so thermal regulation is really important, okay? So we're gonna be talking about like the methods of heat loss, uh, uh, newborn characteristics that lead to heat loss, what is non-shivering thermogenesis, what is brown fat, what about cold stress, hyperthermia, and what exactly is a neutral thermal environment? Brown fat, cold stress, and uh, non-shivering thermogenesis are all important in the transition of the newborn. And it's really important because within that first hour, you are, um, you are assessing all of this to make sure that this baby is transitioning correctly. So methods of heat loss, there's four of them. One, conduction, which is that transfer of heat from object to object when two objects are in direct contact with each other. So when you think of like a cold stethoscope or um, cold hands or a cold restraining board and, and too warm is so warm hands or too much heat, um, all of that plays a role and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Convection is when heat is transferred to air surrounding the infant such as like a cool draft like air conditioning, fans, um, working at a window or like working in an isolate so babies um, tend to lose heat that way. Evaporation is like when wet surfaces are, are exposed um, to such uh, objects uh, like amniotic fluid, vernix, or like um, you know a wet baby after a bath. And then radiation is that transfer of heat to um, a cooler object that are not in direct contact with the infant, such as like a crib by like an outside wall or uh, the crib by an outside window. Those are the methods of heat loss. So there's certain characteristics that lead, heat, that lead to heat loss. One is that there's a higher ratio of body surface to body mass in adults. Um, blood vessels are closer to the skin. There's less sub-Q fat, and then there's thinner skin. One of the things I want you to think about, too, is when you have a premature baby, they got to do all of this without everything being full term. So they have even a greater um, risk of you know respiratory distress as well as infection, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Non-shivering thermogenesis is babies don't shiver, okay? They do not have fully functioning sweat glands. Um, Non-shivering -shiv thermogenesis is the mobilization of stores of this brown fat that can double heat production. And what it is, it's unique to the newborn. There's an abundant number of blood vessels that are, are included in this fat, and as it metabolizes, the blood vessels are warmed and then it travels to the body. And these pockets of brown fat are found like on the sternum area, um, around the heart, um, around the, behind the scapula, around the kidneys, around the adrenals, um, and that helps keep a baby, baby warm, okay? Now, cold stress. Cold stress um, is, uh, is important that we need to, talk, to um, talk about it. But before I do, I want to just mention hyperthermia. So hyperthermia is not good either. So all of these things that we do to keep a baby warm, which is, you know, we have the warmer on, we have blankets available for them, we do skin to skin and cover the baby, we put a hat on the baby's head. All of this is our methods to, to maintain a, a baby's temperature. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in keeping a baby warm that we think about, we do over, overkill it, okay? So sometimes they'll put a baby under a warmer wrapped in blankets and, you know, they don't sweat and they can't tell you that they're hot and so what happens is, is the same thing that happens with cold stress is anything that's gonna increase the metabolic rate is not good, okay? So let's talk about cold stress. So when a baby is cold, our bodies are gonna do what it, it needs to do to keep warm. Now, as you can see on the slide that we talk about cold stress, it talks about an increase um, in oxygen consumption, an increase in glucose consumption, and do, um, it decreases surfactant production. So it's just gobbling up all of the reserve basically what it is okay so therefore we talked about the metabolic rate increasing and that's exactly what this happens with this more energy is needed using up all of the glucose and creating the very real risk of hypoglycemia which is terrible for a newborn okay 
and that could lead to metabolic acidosis. Surfactant, which we already know that the importance of surfactant is that it lines the alveoli, you know, with, so that they don't collapse when the baby takes that first breath. So if that surfactant is compromised as well because of, of because it's a metabolic resource, it's used for this thermogenesis is not keeping the alveoli aligned. It's diverted to keeping the baby warm instead of doing what it's supposed to be doing um, in, the, in the alveoli. So when the alveoli collapse, we already know, we talked about respiratory distress. Um, you're also going to see a change in skin temperature, skin color, and all of this greatly compromises perfusion. Now we talk about acrocyanosis. Acrocyanosis at first, that's where your blue hands and blue feet are considered a normal finding. And that's just because of fetal circulation seizing. So it takes still a few minutes for um, a little bit of time for that to go away. Without perfusion, even though they're breathing faster, um, respiratory acidosis could occur. And these need to be corrected almost immediately. So our goal is a neutral thermal environment, and that's where heat production equals heat loss.